he presented the project to me and he told me if I would uh, work with him, he asked. At that time, I was like, I was desperate <laughs> to get funds for, uh, for research and do my PhD. So I accepted the offer. I thought I got a great chance, but anyone who wants to pursue an academic career did not refuse. However, later I came to realize that I made a decision that affected the academic career I was dreaming of, but at the same time, I got to learn a lot. I was exposed to an experience where I learned a lot from it, and I think it is important to share it. Because uh, normally when we are doing research, uh, uh, we are asked to reflect about our journey, we tend to overlook these kind of issues. Some essential parts of uh, of managing our challenges that happen during doing the PhD as a whole process, not just reflecting on our challenges during our fieldwork as the research methodology book. So through the German partner, I came to know about Bayreuth International Graduate School for African Studies, and he advised me to apply for Vixas Junior Fellow position. Of course, stating all the benefits I can have and that any PhD student who is doing research on Africa or in Africa, if they join University of Bayreuth, it is best for them to be part of this study. So um, we didn't sign a contract, um, but uh, yet the, the plan is that I first go to Germany, uh, I completed a preparatory course, that and pass my evaluation, then I will get to sign the contract. But at the same time, he wanted me to start doing an, explore, an exploratory fieldwork while I am preparing my application for Big Stats. I remember he gave me 400 euros cash and made me sign a sign kind of receipt. I, I took the money, of course, and I started to, um, to work on the, on the exploratory research, uh, field research, field work. And I took a leave from the university from my job. And also at the same time was preparing for my proposal. Uh, of course, he supported my application to Big Stars. And I got admitted of the visa and on a plane to Germany. So, um, what happened after that? So, I want to talk about my main challenges, which I will frame them in, uh, in institutional and systematic discrimination. So, what does that mean? What do I mean by institutional systematic discrimination? I am not only talking about explicit racist violence, you know, and openly discriminatory act, act, actions, like many reports about international student challenges in Germany will say. For example, the people are racist, a woman who didn't want to sit next to me uh, uh, on a bus, someone who said to me, go back to your country, or language barrier, having difficulties to get accommodation. I do acknowledge that. It has devastating impact on foreign students. But here I am talking more about structures structure that systematically disadvantage foreign students. So um, I'll talk about, I mean, there were different systematic of discrimination, but I will talk basically about the funding, the funding uh, issue in this uh, presentation. So, yeah, um, there are, um, like, if you want to fund a PhD in Germany, there are several ways to do that. Um, so, um, there you can uh, fund, have a, have a paid PhD or a part-time PhD uh, with a title or with a position of academic assistant research or research associate. You get 
uh, paid by a third party scholarship, like in ITA you have, like, for example, the, the DID or the CAD. The DID is the uh, German Academic Exchange Services, the CAD, which is the Catholic Academic Exchange Services, so these are called third party scholarships. You get funded by a home institution in your country, like for example, if you are coming on a scholarship from, like if you are working at the university, then you will come on a scholarship from the Ministry of Higher Education. Or you are saving, or you're saving, which is blocking a saving account, and then uh, monthly you will get an, uh, a payment to for your for your accommodation and your health insurance and so on. So, um, yeah, so um, it, it's also like it's very important to know that there is a limit when you are in Germany and you want to do a visa and uh, you want to have like a, um, a monthly allowance, there is a limit of 720 euros. So when you get also when you get funding from uh, your home institution, that should be the limit what you get. Otherwise, you will not get, uh, you will not graduate a student visa. So sorry, I'm going to, I'm apologizing in advance uh, for the German bureaucracy that I'm going to <laughs> mention now, but it, it's very important to situate the whole idea of what, what do I mean by the discrimination in the funding process. Um, so when you are a paid PhD student, you will be offered a fixed time work contract That's when you are paid. So a fixed time work contract or this TVL E13 with 50% TVL E13 with 75, what does that mean? So it means that um, you get, uh, it's a part time, okay? And E13, this is a, 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 it's a level of, of civil servant in Germany. And um, it also tells about your experience. So the typical gross salary for a PhD student is 3,000 point something euros. Uh, but the next salary or the take home salary depends on something called the Stufa which means that the grade or the level uh, which affects the experience of, your, uh, of the employees, I said. Uh, so as a fresh PhD student, you first, in your first year, you will be uh, in Stufa 1. The second year, you will be in Stufa 2. The, second, the third year will be Stufa 3. So every year, we'll get some kind of an, an, an increase in your salary. And um, it also depends on the 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 wage tax uh, the wage tax class. So you have like from five to from one to five, and you are um, allocated to a specific uh, tax uh, income tax uh, uh, package. Um, so for example, here if in the slide, if you see um, the table here, uh, the gross salary you get is. 3,000, when you take all the, uh, like you take all the, the, the taxes and all the, 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 the deductions you pay, then it will end up like 1,800, that's your gross salary, and it will increase every year. So you have like income tax, you have something like solidarity surcharge, your national social insurance, health insurance, nursing and care insurance, pension fund, unemployment insurance, and compulsory insurance. So it is compulsory, for example, in Germany, to have a stay for your uh, retirement. So this is why um, you get a lot of deductions, uh, but your health insurance is paid. So it somehow, it gives you kind of a stable decision. And it's also, what is also important is about the unemployment insurance. So even after, even if you lose your job or um, your um, your scholarship.
relationship ended and you didn't finish your thesis yet, you can go for the unemployment insurance. So this is one uh, one way. The second is scholarship. So many German funding organizations support exceptionally talented international PhD students. As a rule, the requirement is an above average to a first degree academic record. Some institutions have additional expectations, such as specific commitments to social, political, or religious causes. A scholarship is granted for a limited time, as a rule for two to three years, and students usually must uh, reapply every year. Organizations that provide scholarships from, for outstanding students usually also support them with seminar opportunities to exchange views with uh, within an alumni network. The highest you get paid in a PhD program scholarship is 1,200 euros, and the lowest is around 1,000 euros. Scholarships are exempt from income tax. They are mostly coming from government, coming from government funding, taxpayers, or from like here, as you stated, in the, from the European Union, from the industry sector, so, um, yeah, some scholarships give you family allowance and some support half of your monthly health insurance payment. So it's also one of the ways to, uh, one of the, also the, the very, uh, I would say very good opportunities uh, for funding your PhD, uh, your PhD or your PhD journey. Uh, so let's go back to my experience. So I'm sure some of you are asking that uh, with my initial agreement, I should not have issues with funding. So what happened? When I came to Germany and joined Big Fast, I did not start immediately my PhD. I started with a preparatory course, which includes the basic level of German language. And uh, writing my PhD proposal for six months, then you get evaluated. The initial uh, agreement was I get uh, a paid part-time or at least that was the, the project. You know, that was the, that was the proposed uh, project with the, the agreement with my supervisor. However, I realized later that the funds my supervisor has, has was not enough to support three years paid contract of 70% paid contract, not even for one year, let alone three years. In fact, this was some money remaining from another Sudanese PhD candidate who left the project before finishing. I told my supervisor that these are not sufficient funds for a PhD, and I wanted to apply for a scholarship. So just to mention something like it's uh, important to know that Big Start used to give scholarships. So some students will be admitted with a scholarship. Some will be admitted without a scholarship. The customary practice is that when you come to Big Start without a scholarship, you will receive funding from six to 12 months, depending on your preparatory course and evaluation, which is used to be like 900 euros per month. So after that, uh, the DIJ used to allocate lots of scholarships to big staff students. So it's somehow like kind of an underlying agreement that, sorry, if you are coming to big staff, you will definitely get a DIJ um, scholarship. However, that year, um, there was a, a kind of a budget cut down. So they had to reduce the slot that comes to big staff to two scholarships. So then all big staff students are actually competing for two scholarships. Um, I talked to my, as I said, I talked to my supervisor, I want to apply for these two scholarships, and he agreed at the beginning. And I started to work on the proposal and my funding application. So when it's time to submit my funding application, he refused to write me a recommendation letter. And he told me, my proposal is not ready. 
this was a traumatic experience. I was, I felt I was deceived. I felt I was betrayed. He was still my supervisor, of course, and I didn't want to com uh, confront him. So I decided to take the one year, which is instead of being a 75% contract, it became a one year 50% contract. And then to, uh, to try to find also another, I, I, I said, okay, I will use this year to find another uh, organization to support me. Um, so it was a very critical situation. And, but there are two things that happened that I will consider a blessing in this guy. The first thing that happened is, uh, which is he is now my uh, like former supervisor, I would call him former supervisor. He was leaving Bayreuth University, you know. So I had the option, either I go with him to another university, to the university where he's going, or I stay at Bayreuth. So I stayed at Bayreuth. And I changed my supervisor to another supervisor. <laughs> so I had to, you know, I had to, this, this was, this, this is one, one of the impacts of funding, that I had to shift to another supervisor. I had to sh completely change my, uh, my, my, my whole thesis structure, and I did come starting from zero. So this is one thing. The second thing is, was also a, a blessing in this guys that when I was, when I, when, when you come and have a degree in Germany, you have, you only get a degree in where your supervisor, uh, your super, in, in which the department of your, your supervisor. So there's no such thing as African studies. It's not, there's no degree that's called African studies. But you get um, your degree in a, in a discipline in a, in a department. And since I came from anthropology, it didn't make sense to me that I get um, a degree in another in another field. So um, what happened is that I went. I talked to the chair of anthropology. And he agreed to take me as a PhD student, so I changed my supervisor. And uh, also the thing is, the good thing is also about big stuff is that you don't have only one supervisor that supervises you, but you have a sort of a group of mentor, mentors. So I just, the mentor became the supervisor and the supervisor became the mentor. And also towards the end of my PhD, I also had to drop one of the the, the, the initial uh, partner of the project. And uh, of course, I missed, I missed my opportunity to, um, to, to, to get a, a, fund, a funding from, a, from an organization. So PIXA, what also was, what was also uh, in our, like somehow helped us is that because there's a lot of students at some point didn't have scholarships. So Vixas came out with this called bailout funding. So the bailout funding supported us. And everyone gets got the bailout funding. But the downside for me with the bailout funding is I was not allowed to have or not eligible to field work fund. And this is when you're not eligible to field work fund, of course for anthropology, this is for anthropology, this is a big issue this is a big problem and when I went um, when I went to do my field work afterwards I had to I had to part-time have a job so I could actually um, fund my field research and this had a lot of impact on um, on the time you know it makes you somehow um, there's, there's a lot of a lot of opportunities uh, in terms of research that you could not take because you are limited on time. This is one thing. The second thing is very important also. This is a problem I think of the, uh, uh, what do I call it? What do I call it? What do I call it? It's called the, like it's, uh, for example, um, as a PhD student, you are coming from a, um, a foreign country. 
you can't stay outside of Germ uh, outside of Germany for six months, so you always have to come back. You know? And this somehow also disturbs your um, it disturbs your your field work rhythm. So if you compare yourself with your German colleagues, your German colleagues could stay twelve months in the field work, no one will tell them that hey, you have to come back home. But for you as a foreign student, you always have to come back before the six months end, and otherwise you have to start a student visa process from the beginning, and it's a long process. Um, so yes, so this is what I call the hustling and bustling. Um, at some point, I mean, uh, the bailout fund was not yeah, that sufficient, but it makes you survive. So after the bailout fund, I also did a lot of things. You know, I I blocked my uh, I blocked accounts. I had to add uh, uh, put on top of it uh, some. I did like I worked. I worked. I had uh, like small jobs here and there. Um, then I applied for. Uh, it came it came later that I applied for this equal opportunity program at the University of Bayreuth. They the kind of fund that for women, uh, women who are in academia. And this is came in a project that is supporting women in academia because they realize when in higher, in higher level of academia, women are not represented. And they are not represented for a lot of a lot of reasons. So this funding came to support women and I got um, I got that funding and I got it under the the, I got it under what's called a hardship funding. So it helped me at the end of the at, at the end of my PhD to to somehow survive and manage to submit and finish. So uh, the question is, what did I learn from that? You know, what did I learn? Um, I learned that. Funding or bringing scholars to Germany or any other Europe, I don't know, any other European country probably be the same experience. It is not, it could probably uh, deal with the issue of uh, uh, brain drain because they always, in scholarships, they want you to, to go back and you know, serve your community, serve your society. So it could deal with that, but it will not deal with Eurocentrism. This is one thing. Research has and still is embedded historically with the dominant Western epistemological framework that has favored its own standards of knowledge and validation. And I, as I said, um, it made me. It made me somehow um, understand that okay, it's not. It's not that. I mean, we have a very, very long time. Uh, we are still far from this decolonization of the world. And uh, this is why I said it's actually my PhD was really uh, a long walk to freedom. Because of my life. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I think I will stop here. I don't know if I have exceeded my time, but I would be happy to yeah to receive questions and uh, yeah to to open the discussion for more uh, yeah more comments, reflection, more reflection. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elsa. Would you mind just stopping sharing your screen so we can um, see each other a little better? Thank you so much. Yeah, so, so thank you so much for uh, what you shared with, with us. Um, when we discussed before this seminar, we were mentioning the, like, the kind of like critical incident that shape our, um, our experiences um, in, as PhD students. So you share with us a, a, a very interesting perspective on 
gender and and citizenship privilege that affected you as a as an international international student in in Germany. So thank you so much for that. Um, I will I will open the floor and and uh, maybe come back for uh, questions later. Is there any question amongst us among the participants? Okay, so I will I will start uh, so you know, people can um, maybe uh, gather their thought and, and and ask uh, a few questions of their own. Um, so one of my questions would be about um, the way this 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 quest for funding and this struggle that you encounter when at your arrival in Germany. How did it shape your um, your, your research questions and your intellectual? Uh, work you you shared with us also how you had to adapt and to adjust um, the content of your research. Um, how did it how did it transform like you know with with this pro those problems and those uh, fight that you had to to lead? Well, um, I think that uh, um, I had to I had to revise a lot of my work. To, to fit a kind of a frame, you know, uh, a research frame. So it's not like the traditional kind of research where you meet the supervisor or then you have only like, it's very traditional. You, you only work with one supervisor the whole class, the whole project. Um, so um, what I would say, what I would say is like, um, as I said, there's a lot of things that we see them there Serving, but they are always come as a as a blessing in disguise. So for me, um, it was a very it was it was not like I learned a lot by by coming to Germany and I learned a lot by engaging with the lively discussions here in Big Start, by engaging with um, students from different backgrounds. So it somehow also opened my horizon. You know, like to 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 have a better understanding of of the world with with all these different views, with all those different projects. We sit in in a seminar, different disciplines. So it all feeds in your somehow in your in your experience, you know, and in your knowledge. I mean, you hear about uh, authors, you hear about uh, uh, like you 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 see how much. Uh, it's out there and it's done. I mean, in, in, in Sudan, um, yes, I mean, to some extent, I was coming from a, 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 a I would say, like one of the top universities, but still, there was this gap you know, of knowledge. So when I came here, I would say it was like actually, it was, a, a, it, it made my, um, my theoretical. Uh, like my theoretical, my theoretical positionality is more wider. I got more challenged, you know, in my ideas. Uh, so it is, it, it did help. You know, I, I will not say, I will, I will not say completely like it, it was an issue, as like it was, uh, uh, and as I said, the blessing in disguise. So it, it did open a lot of, um, yeah, it did, it was an eye opener. Thank you so much. So we have a question from from Sanya now. Mm -hmm. Sanya. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for the interesting presentation. Um, the the question of relocation. In, in pursuit of knowledge and greener pastures of Africans abroad, it's quite um, an interesting and challenging one. And from your presentation, one could see the struggles and challenges that faces the average African or foreign international student in, 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 in um, uh, foreign context. Now, you called it a long walk to freedom. 
how for it, is, is it worth it? One, secondly, because you asked the question, what did you learn? Is it worth it? Secondly, it seems you do need a lot of cultural support when you go on that sort of journey. If not the alienation, you know, because of the, the question of cu culture clash, because first of all, you need to learn a different culture, a different language, and so many other things, the technology and whatever. So I, I'm, 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 what I'm wondering is that, is it really worth it? I mean, um, how, because also you are, uh, I suppose you um, worked on, a, uh, on an African subject in a foreign context. So how, how did, what, it, it took a lot from you. So I want to know more about what it took for you and was it worth it? Well, um, well these are very interesting uh, questions. Um, yes, it was challenging. It did, uh, let's say, psychologically, uh, it did affect me a lot. Um, I had to seek psychological health. And um, I also, yes, I mean, I would say I had a very supporting network here. Like this is one of the, actually this is one of the things that makes it worth it. Um, the friends you have here, the, the support you get from my African colleagues and also my German colleagues. Mostly we were um, my African colleagues. It was, yes, we had, we had that sort of solidarity, you know, even, even they were saying like, I mean, they would say like, do you all Africans know each other? Because when we meet on the street, we're always greeting, we're always sitting in big groups, we're always discussing. So we, we somehow brought kind of um, value to that content. And these values that we have, it's the ones actually that make me, that made me, that helped me to, to navigate such hardship. Um, the difference in languages, I mean, we are always saying that Big Sur is a bubble. Universities generally are bubbles. So, in terms of the the the, the, the education system itself. PhD, of course, you don't need the language, but on your also in, on your everyday life basis, I think you only I only use the language in in when I go to the supermarket or when I go to the doctor. But in my circle, it was always English. Um, so my social my social circle really really helped. And I encourage people to do to have that kind of uh, um, like PhD students to have that kind of support, social support, moral support from your from your peers. Like instead of looking at them as competitors, in fact, you should you see them as a family. And uh, we had actually we had a lot of projects that talked about big cell family, and people were always saying like. Um, I remember like other students were always saying that um, there is some kind of generation in Big Sur where they are really like, they're really connected. So even the generations who came after, like they didn't have that connection, especially when the number of students were, were like becoming smaller and smaller due to also funding constraints. So, and Big Sur was shifting to another program, so on a different structure. But the, when I was there, when I was the, the when I was doing my PhD, it was this kind of community that really helped and support. Um, so oh, yeah, it was worth it in terms of connections, in terms of people. I got to know it was worth. It. Uh, thank you, Aza. We we have a question also from Amina. Amina, I, you wrote the question. Do you want? Can you can you ask it, or do you want us to read it? 
Um, I can tr I can try and ask it. Thank you so much, okay. Aza, for um, the presentation. Thank you, Dominic, for the moderation. I I was wondering about um, about financial literacy. I know that when we have to to seek these scholarships, we also become incredibly financially independent. And I've yeah, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about your journey towards financial literacy as it's not something that, for instance, in my um, social upbringing was not something that was part of my, my daily life. And how do, we, how do we start negotiating which scholarships are the best ones to go for? Um, how do we negotiate salaries based on, you know, the, ex the precarious experiences we go through um, by getting scholarships that don't pay as much. Um, I don't know if my question is clear, but yeah, I, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about how can we actually pursue financial literacy while being an academic without necessarily being, um, or driving like a capitalist agenda. Sorry, um, sorry, can somebody need to to mute themselves? Uh, okay, I think it's it's fine. Aza. Yes. So um, I don't really have um, a specific like I can't tell you specific steps to what to do. I mean, if you scholarships now are everywhere online. I mean, there are groups where you there are uh, blogs where you get find scholarships announced. There are official sites. There's a if you go, for example, if you want to have a scholarship in Germany, you just go and check the, the website of the, the Ministry of Education. Everything is stated there. Um, it becomes, as you said, the, the literacy, the, the financial, the, it's called financial literacy, like, to somehow get aware of these things. It depends on, like in my case, it depends on where I was. So I was, I already found myself in an academic environment where people are um, like establishing networks and bringing these bilateral kind of uh, projects, um, funding students different programs. So I would, I, I would say, um, and it's special, it's actually was special for the department, the department of anthropology. If you look at other departments, this kind of, um, this kind of agreement didn't exist, you know, it came later. But somehow the department of anthropology was really active. <laughs> and it, it was always like that, you know, like, um, I think it was the, <laughs> the easiest way of somehow, I don't know how to say it and how to put it, but it was the easiest, the easiest way of um, having some sort of this kind of bilateral or by, I don't know what it's called, but this kind of, a, you know, like um, this kind of agreement, North, South, universities. So it is active in social sciences in the anthropology was mainly the anthropology and it was very interesting i mean according to because we had in sudan after 90 after like 1989 we had the arabization of our education system and only the only one of the very few um, departments that continued uh, teaching english was the department of anthropology because it was difficult to arabize it. Yeah. So somehow, yeah, I mean, that's it. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually also with the, with the, like the whole idea of language, you know, like um, um, if you have language barriers, I mean, one of the things that helped us, that, I mean, we didn't have that language barrier that happened in this kind of um, disconnection in other, in in other faculties in other uh, sciences so uh, yeah so i would say um it 
depends on where you are. Like there's nothing. No one told us. No one. There was no program of orientation. It is just it, it, where I was. I found it like that. So I found myself in this kind of network somehow. If I got you right, what else did you ask? As yeah, I, I let as a um, as I ask a, a complimentary question if she she desires so. But uh, in the meantime, there, there was um, two more questions at least. So and we have like only a few more minutes. So if you can like keep your answer quite short, so we can have like those, those answers. So. I think Mimi had a question, and, and there was a question also from Divine. Um, can I, should I go first? Yes. Okay. Well, mine is, isn't necessarily a question. It's, um, it's just a comment uh, to, to Sanya, who asked, uh, is it worth it? Is it worth, you know, the long walk to freedom and, and you know, trying to, car to, 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 you know, create a research project in such a very complicated space. I think, yeah, I mean, I did a master's in, Bel in Belgium. And um, I mean, I resonate with some of the challenges that Aza uh, uh, put forward, you know, not necessarily on the funding aspect, but more on the intellectual aspect. Um, it's, 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 I find it really, oh, I found it and still find it difficult to really um, have a good synergy or find a very good bond with a PhD supervisor who, um, who understands holistically the African situation or the African experience. Um, I don't mean to pathologize all European universities, but I, I noticed that there's a tendency for, for those institutions to to study Africa still as kind of more of an exotic um, place. And also I've noticed in some departments that uh, uh, offer, let's say PhD uh, uh, positions to in anthropology, there'll, there'll be a, pr a preference for Europeans to take up those positions to study Africa because maybe those European students get a chance to go to Africa, which is interesting, but there's just that preference for them to actually get a chance to do research in a sort of exotic place. Like, at least that's my, I, I, I can, I, I stand to, 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 to I, I can welcome an argument on that, but that's my, my, my position. Um, so I, I really find it difficult to, to find, or at least in my experience, I've found, found it very difficult to, to really find a supervisor who really resonates with, with, with the scholarship I want to uh, uh, contribute to Africa one that is, has good intention, not one that has some undertones of exoticizing the region. And also I did some, some, some um, field work in, in Brussels in the city, you know, that's predominantly white. And that kind of really, uh, um, uh, you know, made things, the, the whole situation makes sense that it's, it's not really, uh, it's not very commonplace for a black group of students to study uh, a white space. It's more accepted or it's more common for white students to study a black place. I mean, the, the research group I was in was predominantly black and we made it in the, in the news for being black students who studied a white, a white city. So you can just notice that there is, there is a, a tendency to, to study down, you know, white researchers studying Africa, whereas we as black researchers studying uh, white cities in Europe was, oh, okay, who are these people coming to study us? That's very strange. So yeah, just doing anthropology or studying anthropology from a, a developed country or developed institution does have its complexities, I think. And there needs to be some unlearning that, that goes into, into that, especially with selecting PhD candidates to study Africa, who are they selecting and what intention do those white students have when they study the continent is, is, is what I, I would question and interrogate. Yeah. Aza, do you have a, a, a quick comment for, for Mimi? <laughs> Well, I don't have a, I don't have, this is like, she really, 
<laughs> a bigger discussion. Like, I mean, I totally agree with her in everything she said. Um, I, I just want to say, like, there is, there is, like, I mean, I, I agree one hundred percent with what she said. But always there is some sort of hope. Some sort of hope that we actually could make a change. We could change it. It's not difficult. It is difficult, but it's doable. Uh, Asa, we have a last question from from Div from Divine. Uh, Divine, do you want to ask your question? I was planning to not ask it, but my question was just, uh, let me just ask it quickly. Um, uh, it, it's more related to also the uh, uh, framing of this uh, PhD seminar and, and, and the, the question, what, what is the PhD good for? You know, uh, it, it's a simple question. What is the PhD good for that we have to undergo all of this stress to ensure that we actually uh, achieve it? So what is it good for and what should we be looking for? Thank you. Asa, do you have a comment? Um, I mean, we when when you start an academic career, it's always your dream and your vision to do a PhD, to publish, to take notice. We always have you had that vision, so it is part of your academic identity to do a PhD. And I mean, people take different walks of life, but if you like to do research, if you have that kind of, uh, um, like, uh, if you have that, like, that sort of, like, um, somehow, not just critical mind, but you want to understand, you want to understand the world, you have that eager to do research, of course, I mean, we are in systems, I mean, that says, okay, you have, you have to do, pursue that academic career. You do a PhD, so it's a requirement, but at the same time, it's a dream. For me, it was a dream. So I think, I think the question of, of it, if it's worth it or not, it is worth it to do a PhD. It is worth it to um, pursue an academic career. It's not a good paid career, but it's a wonderful career. You learn a lot, you see a lot. It's really, I mean, not in that exoticizing way that uh, Mimi is talking about, but um, you, you, you get to, it, it, it is an experience that adds to you a lot, and even it changes you in terms of your, just, not just academically, but also in terms of your character and your worldview. So, yeah. Thank you so much for your for your answer, Asa. It's um, it's I think it's a great way to uh, to to finish this uh, first uh, session uh, for our seminar. And yeah, thank you to all of the uh, participants that ask great questions um, about decolonizing epistemologies, about um, financing of research, about um, you know the the value of the journey. Uh, as, a, as a doctoral uh, candidate. So those are teams that we are going to pursue um, the anti, uh, the, for, for the next quarters. Uh, next, uh, next week, we are going to uh, discuss um, research questions. What is a good research question with uh, Chikese that is um, among us today? Uh, so thank you so, so much for joining. Thank you, Aza. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll see you again next week. Goodbye. Maybe we.